the people sitting in this room erupted your M1s was about six, give or take 12 months, and that while your M1 was erupting, your central upper incisors were also simultaneously erupting. And those of you who have kids of your own, nieces, nephews, et cetera, et cetera, do keep tabs on the age at which you are when you're erupting certain teeth. And that's kind of um, what I want to, uh, my segue, obviously, it's my title slide, so I have to tell you what the hell I'm going to talk about. And that's really the key issue. I want to try and convey something about features that you might think would be paleontologically invisible, like gestation time or age at, at maturity, you can use teeth to get at this information that you, know, you might otherwise think is, is invisible. Now, before I further demonstrate my status as a dentophile, let me try to make amends and share with you this lovely sketch that I got uh, last night from Mark Witten. And I, I asked him, please draw me uh, on the title page a uh, dinosaur stepping on a mammal, and he did. Um, I think this top one, so that's the mammal right there. And you know, it, it, he gave me what I asked for. I'm very grateful for that. Very wisely spent 30 pounds. Um, pardon me for complimenting myself. And it also demonstrates then this process of taphonomy that I'm not going to talk about. But it is very true uh, that you know pale paleontologists are limited to uh, hard tissues usually. Um, and this this is accelerating the process for that particular individual. So back to the regular plan, which is basically drawing on the work of a biologist by the name of Adolf Schultz, who during the middle part of the 20th century, uh, he, he liked primates a lot, and he included the lovable tree shrew in that category primates. And they're, they're reasonably closely related to primates. And he, um, he made a dichotomy between what he called fast developers and slow developers. A fast developer is something like a tree shrew, according to Schultz. It has a very fast air, uh, part of its lifetime devoted to growth. It reaches adult body size and sexual maturity relatively early. Corresponding with that, the gestation time of a tree shrew is, is pretty, pretty fast. At least it's a lot shorter than what you get in the so-called slow developers, and we are slow developers. We take a long time to reach our adult body size and have a relatively long um, uh, gestation time. And Schultz also plugged in this data on a dental eruption. And so you're looking at here, that's the first molar, that's the second one. And you can see how he's mapped in. This is a figure, by the way, from a book chapter that Holly Smith published in 2000, um, basically summarizing Schultz's idea. And what you see here is that as you get farther down on this spectrum towards um, long gestation time and, and lots of time before you reach adult body size, according to Schultz and Holly Smith and, and others, um, you are beginning to erupt more and more antimolars, premolars, canines, incisors, before your second and third molars. So this is what it's all about. This is this window into physiology and to aspects of growth and development that you might think are paleontologically invisible. But I, tr I want to try and make the case that in some instances, at least, it's not paleontologically invisible. So let's start then with the modern species for which we have all sorts of um, uh, physiological data, gestation time, age at maturity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's actually embarrassing when you get outside of primates how little we know about these basic aspects of physiology and things like golden moles and tenrex and senges and stuff. Um, but certainly for primates, the data are pretty good. And those of you who are fortunate enough to see this excellent poster by Madeline Geiger that I regret to say is not there anymore because none of the posters are there right now, but she talked a lot about this in her, in her poster. Um, I have just a snippet of those data, and so in the case of primates and tupaya, we have indeed a, a significant correlation between gestation time here on the x-axis and proportion of teeth erupting before, uh, at or before the second molar. The correlation is also there with age at female maturity. All of you are certainly observing this outlier homo sapiens, um, and even when you remove that, and, and even when you begin to correct for phylogeny by reducing the degrees of freedom, counting, for example, only the high-level clays instead of the genera as, as your sample size, the significance is, is still there. So at least for primates, there's this reasonably, reasonably uh, uh, correlated uh, relationship between dental eruption, gestation time, and dental eruption, and age at female maturity. So 
what does this have to do with hyraxes? Well, here's the living Procabia capensis. It's about the size of a rabbit. Um, the males will sometime, sometimes get approached four or five kilos, but they're, you know, they're small animals. Those of you who have visited Table Mountain in Cape Town will have seen them, and maybe if you were misbehaving, fed them. You shouldn't do that, but um, the tourists do. Um, and one of the remarkable things about Procavia is that it's the size of a bunny and it has a seven month intrauterine gestation time. It has more in common with us in terms of gestating its young for an incredibly long period of time than it does with a rabbit and rabbits or hares at least are similar in body size. The other interesting thing about Procavia capensis is the fact that before its second molar is fully erupted, these two permanent premolars are fully erupted and this is not a damaged jaw, at least not in this part that I'm circling. This is a, a virtually dissected jaw that's showing you that there are no permanent teeth about to replace P2, P3. So those are, that's part of the permanent dentition. So a hyrax is like a human in terms of erupting antimolars before its second molar and having a very long uh, gestation time. It's also fairly long lived for its body size. Um, so continuing the story then about hyraxes, I was very, very lucky to be able to collaborate uh, like my colleague who just uh, preceded me with our, our, uh, this wonderful collection from Northern Africa, particularly the Fayum. Um, and the most common fossil that you get at the most of these quarries in Fayum, I'm not sure if that's true for Burkitt, um, uh, for, for BQ1 or BQ2, but um, most of these quarries, the most common fossils are these things, hyraxes. And of course, there are growth series. So Duke has almost as nice a CT scanner. Actually, they have the same one. So it's, it's a very nice CT scanner. And my colleagues Hesham Salam and Greg Gunnell um, uh, scanned a lot of these things. And so we know what the eruption sequences are in animals like Thyrohyrax myri and Sagatherium bauni. And it's quite easy to observe that these animals are not behaving like the modern rock hyrax. These animals are erupting their uh, premolars, the fossil hyracoids are erupting premolars after the second molar, whereas the extant Procabia erupts before the second molar. So um, here's a, a, another depiction of that same phenomenon. Here's a thyrax, thyrohyrax jaw showing you the permanent four P1 to P4 teeth embedded in their crypts um, with the DP4 and DP3 sitting there above them. That's the M1, that's the M2. The M2 is fully erupted and these permanent teeth are deep in the jaw. And like I was saying already, the rock hyrax living Procavia capensis shows the opposite, right? So the permanent premolars are fully erupted before that second molar is there. So what we got here, uh, if we try and connect this with this pattern that Adolf Schultz proposed, is that a rock hyrax erupts like a great ape or a human, it erupts its teeth. And a thyrohyrax is erupting its teeth kind of like a strepsorine or a new world monkey. If we continue to Schultz's rule, then the conclusion is that Sagatherium and thyrohyrax are fast developers, or at least faster than Procabia compensis. Now, there are a few qualifications before you think that I actually believe this. Um, I, I'll, it may be true, but hear me out. Um, there are some data on gestation time and uh, uh, and speed of development in Afrotheres. Um, there's about 70 odd species of uh, this endemic African clade, and you could count on two hands the number that have good data. These are living mammals. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing that in 2017 that's the case. So in any event, with a f the few data points that we have, you map them, you try and get these correlations with gestation time and proportion of teeth erupting, and you don't get significant correlations, not with Afrotheria as a whole, either with gestation time or with age at female maturity. So that's one qualifier that I'm obliged to, to tell you about before I get carried away about inferring physiology in thyrohyrax. Um, the other thing I, I'm obliged to tell you is that the, the living hyrax has much uh, larger tooth crowns than the fossils, one, fossils do. And I hope that's obvious here. This is a, a Sagatherium jaw um, with perfectly decent tooth crowns. But as you can see, that's a, that's a much more brachydont crown than this uh, rock hyrax. Um, and just very recently, Christine Burma and Helder Gomez Rodriguez have a couple, like I said, recent papers linking eruption patterns with crown height. And that has a very intuitive basis because obviously the more crown you have, the longer it's going to take for that tooth to get out of the jaw. So I'm, I'm leaving those two qualifiers there. 
And I think the way to solve this, I mean, to me, this is a very exciting possibility. I'm glancing at Phil because I hope I have plenty of time left. Good, okay. Um, the, the, there's a lot at stake, right? So using these dental features, I'm submitting to you that we can say that a, a hyrax that's been extinct for 30 million years had a shorter gestation time than a living hyrax based on its teeth. And the way we can uh, uh, test that, uh, shorter gestation time and age at uh, maturity, is to look at um, something like cementum growth lines, which you can do. This is a figure from a PhD thesis um, from Rhodes University in South Africa from back in the 1980s. And it's a very blurry figure here, but you can see a little bit of one growth line there. There, These are from specimens that are from known age. And the cementum, which is true for many species that have some seasonality to their habitat, uh, the, the known ages correspond with the number of cementum growth lines. So here we have a graph showing you when a living rock hyrax reaches adult size, when that line plateaus. Here we have the age of that animal. And if this hypothesis is true, that the eruption patterns in thyrohyrax and Sagatherium are telling us something about the physiology, then the prediction is there's, they should have fewer cementum growth lines when they reach adult uh, body size, which you can easily do with the, these, these samples um, that we have from, from the Fayum. Um, right, so we haven't done that yet, and I think that's ob obviously the next step. Uh, so I think then I'm just going to conclude um, and tell you, first of all, that living rock hyrax as Procabia resembles humans in its dental er eruption patterns. We know that it's a slow developer. Certainly it has a very long gestation time for its body size. Fossil hyraxes, I predict, we predict, will have a faster development, maybe shorter gestation times, and what we can, I think, eventually figure out more confidently is the age at which it reaches uh, sexual maturity, when we can get our hands on cementum growth lines. And I think with that, I will simply end, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>